Well, hello. We are now in week 15 for our emerging diseases and uh, uh, infectious, emerging and infectious diseases course. But this week we're going into part three of emerging diseases and pandemics. So let's get started. As always, what you're going to see in the slides is a general coverage. Um, what you're going to see is some mention of the name of the disease, the pathogen. I will try to include in certain cases, um, for example, with a virus, a viral map. So what is the structure of it, etc. So you're going to have structure presence of toxin, endospore respiration or metabolism. That sometimes can be helpful. Locations of pathogen or any reservoirs, symptoms and signs. Um, we will also try to be uh, looking at, at the symptoms. Keep in mind that signs are objective and externally observable. Symptoms are a person's reported subjective experiences. We will also look at whether there are treatments, antitoxins, antibiotics, antifungal, antihelmetic, or antiprotozoal drugs as well as vaccines. So the first one we're going to be dealing with here is uh, for this week, severe acute respiratory syndrome, SARS, and the corona disease 200, uh, 2019. Now the focus in this particular slide is going to be on, on uh, SARS. What is SARS? It's a viral respiratory disease, and it's caused by a SARS-associated coronavirus. Now, remember that the virus, if you look at it through an e, uh, electron micrograph, you'll see it as having sort of an extension. It looks like a crown. That's what I call it, corona. Um, SARS was first identified at the end of February of 2003, and this was a, during an outbreak that emerged in China and spread to four other countries. Um, the symptoms, they are flu-like symptoms. They may include fever, muscle pain, lethargy, cough, sore throat, also some other nonspecific symptoms. The only symptom that appears to be common to all patients will appear to be a fever above 38 degrees Celsius, which we're talking about over 100. SARS often leads to uh, shortness of breath and pneumonia. Now, this may be uh, directly um, due to a viral pneumonia development or secondary bacterial pneumonia. Now, the average incubation, incubation period for SARS is four to six days, although it is rarely as short as one day or as long as 14 days. The transmission, the primary route of transmission for SARS, COVA, is contact with of the mucous membranes with respiratory droplets or formites. Remember, formites, they're non-living things, door handles and uh, door panels, cell phones, even. surprise, surprise. Um, now, while diarrhea is common in people with SARS, the fecal oral route doesn't appear to be a common mode of transmission. The basic reproductive number for SARS CoV uh, RO, that is going to range from two to four, depending on different analysis. Control measures, once they were introduced by April of, excuse me, April of 2003, reduced the R to about 0 0.4. Now, like all viral diseases, antibiotics don't have a direct effect. They may help against a secondary infection of bacteria. The treatment for SARS is mainly supportive with antipyretics, supplemental oxygen, and mechanical ventilation as needed. There has been some use of ribavirin, an antiviral. And fortunately, there seems to have little or no effect on SARS and no impact on the patient's outcomes. There is currently no proven antiviral therapy.
Here is the, the map of the SARS virus. You can see you have inside here, this is the RNA. It's wrapped with uh, viral proteins. These are nucleo, nucleocapsid proteins here. You have the membrane protein here. So this is really an enveloped virus. Okay. You have an envelope protein right here and a spike protein, S. Okay. Now, if you take a look over here, this is the electron micrograph of SARS coronavirus virion. And so the structures outside give it sort of a crown up here with extensions from the central part. Notice the size 100 nanometers. Now with SARS, you're going to have this acute respiratory distress syndrome. In it, if you'll take a look here, here's the lungs. Here you have the heart. Here you have the trachea coming down the carinae, and then you're going off into the bronchia, uh, bronchi, bronchioles, etc. When you get down to the air sacs, that's where a lot of things are beginning to happen. And it tends to happen that some fluid will build up inside of all the alveoli, and that will reduce gas exchange between the blood from the capillaries uh, to the alveoli and vice versa. So here you have a much more detailed image right here. Now, this is the cause for non-cardiac pulmonary edema. And what we have here is the infection causes the lungs capillaries to leak more fluid than normal into the, al the air sacs, the alveoli. So what you have is, now this is the lumen of the alveolus, okay? And you have here your type 1 alveolar uh, cells. You have the type 2 here, which is acting like a uh, macrophage. And so what happens is you end up with more fluid leaving. It will go into and begin to fill up in here. And you notice that you have this buildup of fluid right here. Okay, you got a surfactant layer, but it's going to build up even further. And this is going to interfere with gas exchange. If you look here in this uh, x ray, you have early pulmonary edema. And you can tell this because one of the things that happens when you take an x ray of the lungs, okay, through a normal chest, not a lot there for solid matter. X rays go through, it appears blackened, okay. But what happens is when you start having this buildup of fluid, you're going to have this opacification. In other words, it's going to be more, um, it's going to be appearing as if there's something there. And you have, in this case, what they call the butterfly pattern here. And in this case here, if you notice, there's very little empty space here and here. And the rest of it is all now becoming filled with fluid and therefore you're going to have this advanced pulmonary edema and this is first occurring usually what happens is it happens in the lower part of the lungs and then moves superiorly okay um how you know you get it well here's some of the pointers about the symptoms now, early SARS symptoms are similar to other respiratory infections. They include, you know, as I mentioned, headache, chills, myalgia, fever. Usually this is seen the first week following the onset. And this is followed by cough, shortness of breath, which typically appear in the second week. The shortness of breath particularly is telling you that you're not having as much gas exchange. You're not having as, as much gas going into the lungs as necessary. And you can see that almost what they call the ground glass appearance or the opacities in the uh, peripheral lower lung areas, and that's due to fluid buildup. Now, we're going to move from SARS, and our focus is now going to go toward COVID. 
and there's a, a lot you could talk about COVID. Um, this is just sort of a glossary point, but first off, we have COVID-19. Where did we get COVID-19? It's coronavirus, and the year was 2019. Um, it was a new outbreak, and it had emerged in Wuhan, China. It was definitely being reported in December of 2019, but there were evidences that it occurred or was reported having occurrences as far back as October. Not to be taken in any way against individuals who are Chinese. It is the government that helped kind of clamp down. Nobody wanted to report bad news. So this disease began to spread. And on top of that, there was a general ambiguity. Was it occurring because of a wet market? And, and those that are not familiar with a wet market, the wet market is basically where you go down if you want something like chicken or such. No, folks, it's not like in, in the U.S. where you have it nice and it's prepared and it's wrapped in plastic and all you get is the chicken meat. Nope. You get to see the live chicken there and they behead it there. And in some cases, if you wanted bats or you wanted something else. And so what tends to happen is in these wet markets, literally is, uh, the ground will be um, loaded with lots of blood. Okay. But 800 meters away was a viral research center that was supposedly up, I think it was BL4 the Wuhan Virus Institute. And they were very uncooperative in the beginning in revealing information about what they knew of COVID. They had been doing research in bats in various caves to see how was it that um, bats could withstand these viruses, A, and B, what other viruses were present in these bats. And there were a lot of other questions with some substantiation, but not 100%. And, you know, all I can say is that there were some considerations that there was a bioweapon being developed. Others were saying that they were just being really uh, withholding information and trying to blame it on other places, um, other countries, etc., for COVID. But the country pretty much shut down by about January of 2020. And the only activity in the Wuhan area literally was crematoriums. And this was because anybody that was infected and died of it, they had to get rid of the body very quickly. Now, fruit bats have been shown character lit characteristically of a reservoir, being a reservoir host. Okay. The symptoms of the coronavirus include fever, cough, shortness of breath, chills, headache, muscle pain, congestion or runny nose, sore throat, fatigue, or loss of taste and smell. Now, this, these last couple points are something of an interest because if it was coming in as a respiratory ailment, the virus may actually have gotten into the area of the olfactory tissue going up along the olfactory nerves, through the cribriform plate, and around the olfactory bulb and into the brain itself by that route. One of the other interesting things is that there are less common symptoms, such as stomach symptoms of nausea, vomiting, diarrhea. The serious problem was with severe illness, you end up with acute respiratory failure. And this is in part related to what we see next is pulmonary edema. You can have sepsis, septic shock, or multi-organ failure, and then eventually death. COVID-19 symptoms may appear anywhere from 2 to 14 days after exposure to the virus. Now, the SARS-CoV-2 has consistently mutated over the course of the pandemic, resulting in variants that are different from the original um, COVID virus. This is because you have an RA, RNA virus that can at times be somewhat sloppy in its replication. 
many RNA viruses are known to be sloppy in replication and therefore subject to creating variants, mutations in the next generation of the virus. Some of these, uh, gen and some of these mutations don't do anything. Others make it much more resistant to things like vaccinations and things like that. <clears throat> Excuse me. In the early months that we did have the global pandemic, the sad thing was that doctors had no way to treat it. And all you could do is palliative care, try to make them comfortable, give them oxygen, etc. cetera. Um, and individuals, um, sadly, um, if it came to coming to a place like uh, uh, a retirement home or something else like that, they, they couldn't even see the relatives. Uh, when you have a large cluster of people tightly together in a limited space like nursing homes or something like that or hospitals, there tends to be a higher chance of transmission from one person to the other. Okay. Now, fortunately, we moved to 2023 and there are tests for COVID, both clinical and home tests, and they are available. Uh, many of them are just looking for the presence of the virus in the oral cavity or nasal cavity. Okay. There have been a series of vaccines approved for the prevention of COVID. Now, there's a series that everybody is familiar with, which is the mRNA-based uh, um, vaccines. These go under the name of Comoradity. They, they are also produced. Uh, Comoradity is one that makes it. Modernera makes it. Pfizer Biotech makes it. Spikevax makes it. The main principle there is that the RNA is put into tissue and it will start releasing proteins that teach the immune system whenever you see this, meaning it's usually external proteins on the outside of the virus, that it will train the system to consider it foreign and thereby being attacked. Now, one company, Novavax, made a viral spike, a viral protein spike uh, vaccine. Basically, what they did was they just made a completely protein uh, vaccine. This was accepted, although it was sluggish in going through all the trials and getting all of the documentation necessary to be sent out. Um, had it been earlier, it would have probably been a lot easier because there were a lot of people that objected to the messenger RNA for a lot of crazy reasons. One of them literally was they were afraid it was going to change their DNA. Um, there was a pharmacist early when the first batches were out who literally destroyed 500 batches of the vaccine. Now, here is a pharmacist trained in areas of biology and medicine and chemistry, etc., but still believed in the rumors that the mRNA vaccine would harm people and destroyed these, he eventually went to jail for 10 months. Okay. There's a difference between the scientific data and the pseudo accusations and false claims and everything else. And as we have gone through this course, we have to be aware of that as even in situations where we may have another pandemic, we have to really be cautious not to buy into all sorts of craziness. One clear example of that is if you ever get to see the movie Contagion. There's one individual that talks about how there was a, a treatment and the treatment turned out to be something he called forsythia, like an extract from a plant. And... Uh, it had no real effects. But he kept saying that. And he would use the accusations that the government is hiding this, the pharmaceuticals are hiding this, etc. And eventually he was um, arrested and charged with fraud. 
And it's interesting, as you watch the movie, you'll note that even though he had been consuming the forsythia, he was still having some type of biological headgear to protect him from getting exposed to the unknown virus at the time. This is after he's been taking his forsythia. So, we have a diagram here that basically sh shows the uh, possible roles of animals. In the transmission, the potential intermediate host, the natural experimental infection of animals, etc. The key point here is, and here is, of course, that virus, is believed that the bat is the natural host for this virus. It can jump over to intermediate hosts like pangolins and snakes. It is believed that in experimental infections, you had all of these type of um, rodent species, um, feline species, primate species, ferrets, experimental uh, animals such as shrews. You did not have any infection, interestingly enough, in rabbit, chicken, dog, uh, duck, pig, etc. But you did have the natural infections, and it was interesting because some um, animals were being able to get up, cats, dogs, lions, tigers, and minks. And I remember hearing about one news case where uh, I think it was tigers that, res that picked up the COVID disease and died from it in the zoos. <clears throat> now, what we're seeing here, though, is something important also, and that is animal to human transmission, jumping the species barrier. There's no real barrier and passing it on uh, the virus. OK. Now, um, without getting into that long, long list, this is something to peruse. Um, you can see the various panels recommendations for how to help individuals uh, with depending on the disease severity of COVID. OK, the pharmacological management of patients with it is based on disease severity. All right. And you go from a mild to hospital hospitalized. But in this case, even here, uh, you don't need external oxygen. You use dexamethasone, and the idea being that you would remove some of the excess fluid and inflammation, et cetera, that is occurring in the lungs. There had been, over a period of time, even though they hadn't even come up with a uh, vaccine yet, um, Basically, people who had survived the COVID virus were um, basically able to have their antibodies separated out from a blood uh, donation. And what you see then is they can then pass these antibodies on to someone who is pro severely ill, and it can help those hospitalized patients. So we continue to go down. Now, by the way, CMO, you'll see it down in extracorporeal membrane oxygenation. And you get into a lot of very invasive procedures. Um, one of the one of the series of drugs that are being used, um, not just the anti-inflammatory dexamethasone, but then we start seeing antivirals, redesimir, des etc. Some of this has changed because of the fact that we have a larger amount of the population now that has herd immunity. And therefore, the spread, and consider this, in spreading, you have more people, more people have um, the situation where they may have the virus slightly mutating, and thereby, um, by doing this, you blunt the probability or the incidence of mutations. You still will have them. And in some cases, some of the vaccinations will protect against the other 
um, variants, but others will not. And that's why we've gone into boosters. Okay, <laughs> so let's go to something, com uh, I wouldn't say completely different. It's somewhat still there. It's another type of coronavirus called the Middle East Respiratory Syndrome, MERS. Now, Middle East Respiratory Syndrome related coronavirus or EMC 2012, Yep, it was first seen, first reported in 2012. This is a virus that causes the Middle East Respiratory Syndrome. Interestingly enough, it is a species of coronavirus that infects humans, bats, and camels. First reported in Saudi Arabia, 2012 in December. Okay? And if you look at this, the symptoms of MERS start to appear about five or six days after a person is exposed. But the, but the range can go from, again, two to 14 days. For symptoms, patients confirmed to have this mers cova infection have had um, severe respiratory illness with symptoms of fever, cough, shortness of breath. Some people also have had diarrhea and nausea and vomiting. With many people um, with MERS, more severe complications can follow, such as pneumonia and kidney failure. About three or four out of every 10 people reported with MERS have died. So it's morbidity, excuse me, it's mortality was running about, based on the small number though, was running about 30 to 40%. Now, most of the people who died had a pre-existing medical condition that weakened their immune system or an underlying medical condition that had yet to be discovered. This may play a role in why the numbers were three to four out of every 10. Now, what type of medical conditions? Well, they could have had some type of respiratory disorder, COPD, uh, kidney problems, cardiovascular, weakened immune uh, function, etc. The situation is such that medical conditions sometimes weaken people's immune systems and make them more likely to get sick or have severe illness. Treatment or vaccine. There is at present no specific vaccines or treatment for this disease. There are a number of them that are under development. And couple of things. This is the Middle East Respiratory Syndrome coronavirus type. And as you can see, somewhat similar. Uh, you have the nucleocapsid here. You have the spike protein, the membrane proteins. Of course, this is an enveloped virus. Okay. And what you have here is a relatively simple uh, RNA that's in there that codes only for specific proteins for the replication of the virus, period. If you look at the pathophysiological axis and the current treatment strategies, well, here are some of the current treatment strategies, but let me start here with the physiological axis. Sometimes you're going to have this by contaminated water, but the primary host appears to be bats. There can be an intermediate host, which is camels. Now, the transmission of the virus came uh, from camel to milk is through consumption of its meat or milk. This is something to keep in mind. <clears throat> Some people went as um, tourists. And one of the touristy things that some people in the uh, Middle East would do is they would ride a camel. They would also drink um, raw camel milk. Unfortunately, that's how they got the zoonotic transmission from camel to human. Now, um, the transmission of this MERS COVID from camel can occur to other animals, cow, donkey, and goat. Human to human transmission, it can occur. Um, you can have this in community contact in a hospital patient Nosocomial transmission, uh, healthcare personnel can get uh, infected. The other thing that happens is that when you look at the transmission of the virus from a group to a larger population, this is what you can see. 
The symptoms are going to be listed here. Headache, joint pain, fever, chills, breathing problems. Okay. So this is something to keep in mind. Now, as I said to you before, um, MERS COVID has a unique mode of transmission to humans via camels. The idea starts with the bats, and they're thought to be the original reservoir of the virus. You have this cross-species contamination, and the virus spreads over to dromedary camels. Now, either you're a camel driver, a camel herder, or you're someone that happens to be in close contact with the camels, let's say, on a trip as, as a guest, and you decide, well, I'm going to go out there and try out camel riding for a bit. That's where you're going to have the zoonotic transmission going from animal to human, so from camels to humans. And then the other possibility is nosocomial transmission. Now, compared to hospital transmission, Household transmission is rare, so it's much easier in the confines of a hospital for this disease to be passed around. From here, we're going to move into the influenza virus, and there's a nice chapter um, in your readings about a public health concern. Many people are familiar with seasonal influenza, the flu, and it's an acute respiratory infection caused by influenza viruses. Now, you might sit there and say, well, how do they determine the viruses that are going to come when the winter starts coming up in North America or in the Northern Hemisphere? Um, and how do you know make the vaccines for them? Well, what occurs is that they look down on what's going on in the Southern Hemisphere. And, you know, Australia and South America and lower parts of Africa. And if they pick up, and the epidemiologists, et cetera, particular strains that seem to be completely unique, and there's no record of us ever having a serious um, exposure. And if, the, if this particular strain is much, much more virulent, then that gets uh, the concerns of public health, uh, World Health Bodies, CDC, and also vaccine makers. Now, this is to give you some background because in, it's common in all the parts of the world that we're going to see influenza viruses. Most people recover without treatment. Now, there are four types of influenza viruses, A, B, C, and D. So let's talk about these for a minute. Flu influenza A and B viruses cause seasonal epidemics of the disease in people. This is known as the flu season, which occurs mostly every winter in the United States. Okay. Influenza A viruses are the only influenza virus known to cause flu pandemics. And it's the global epidemics of the flu disease, the Spanish flu, the Hong Kong flu, etc. Okay. Now, of course, remember that a pandemic can occur when a new or different influenza A virus emerges that infects people, jumps national boundaries. And so it basically has the ability to spread efficiently through among people and against which many people have little or no immunity. Um, in 2009, there was serious concern that they would have an influenza outbreak that would be a pandemic. Fortunately, it kind of died out and the strategies that were prepared seem to alleviate that. Okay. Influenza C virus infections generally cause a mild illness and are not thought to cause human epidemics. Influenza D viruses primarily will affect cattle with a spillover to other animals, they're not really known to infect people to cause illness. How is this transmitted? Usually by airborne respiratory droplets, coughs, sneeze, etc., by, touch, by touching contaminated surface, formite, by saliva, kissing, sharing drinks, by skin to skin 
contact, like handshakes or hugs. What are the symptoms of the influenza virus? Fever, aching muscles, chills, sweats. Now, there are other symptoms that can occur. Headache, dry, persistent cough, shortness of breath, tiredness and weakness, runny or stuffy nose, sore throat, eye pain, vomiting and diarrhea. Also, these can be flu symptoms, but these are some things that you see more commonly in children than in adults. What is the best way to prevent the disease? Vaccination. Here is the influenza virus. If you notice that you have these two proteins on the exterior that help uh, basically to help scientists understand what type of virus it is. So we have, they're going to say H2N1 or H1N2. The H stands for the hemagglutinin protein here. The N is the neuraminidase protein right here. This is again an enveloped virus. Okay. You have non-structural proteins here. You have a nucleoprotein over here. One of the unique things that happens with influenza viruses is the virus is not having a genetic uh, strand that is complete. It's actually segmented. They may refer to them as cartridges. You will have eight pieces. Now, these eight pieces can be uh, mixed and matched. And what I mean by that is that let's say you have two different types of influenza viruses coming together, infecting the same soul, uh, cell. When that occurs, you have the potential to not only make um, influenza viruses, but new combinations within uh, the genetic area of the virus. And so you may create these new situations for influenza to have different strains. Now, because this is, again, RNA, you can have two forms of changes in influenza viruses. You have what is referred to as genetic drift, which means that somewhere along the sequence, there's maybe a, a point mutation, okay? An A instead of a T, a T instead of a G, and that leads to some type of newer changed protein, perhaps instead of um, alanine, it's proline, et cetera. Not a big deal. Genetic shift is when you have a much larger amount of the RNA being changed because new cassette has been put in here. Now, granted, this can only hold eight, but you notice they're not all connected, so you can shuffle them around. And this is what they think occurred with the Spanish influenza. Here you have H1N1 influenza virus. Transmission went from birds to humans. And so what happened is you had a bird virus coming in contact with human beings. And originally, the human beings had never had this experience with this particular strain of the virus. That's why it had a higher mortality rate. And by the way, if you remember, 18, excuse me, 1918 was a time in which we were, the United States was still involved with World War I. It was said that you would have troop transports, basically large boats that held troops. And by the time that they got to uh, some places in Europe or the UK, and they would, in some cases, have to disembark many bodies. It is said that the pandemic influenza killed more U.S. soldiers than the bullets that occurred in World War I. Well, here you have an interesting thing right here. Let's take and look and see here. We had the 
Asian influenza, 1957. Now, you have the avian virus, H2N2, and it has the human virus, H1N1. And so by co-infecting cells, you end up with a reassortment here, which you have gen uh, the genetic segments um, where you're going to have some of the avian influenza virus and some of the human. And now you're going to have this new strain of influenza virus, and it's going to have five segments, RNA segments, basically from the 1918 original virus. Surprise, surprise. Okay. Move another um, 11 years later. Hong Kong influenza. H3N2 influenza. This is the H3 avian virus. You have the human H2N2 virus. A reassortment, if you look, you've got now two of the strands of RNA that come from the H3. You have one that is coming from the H2N2. And you have one, two, three, four, five that came literally back all the way to the Spanish influenza. Now, this is part of the problem. Every time I, I, I read upon this, scientists talk about this, every 20 years they expect a, an influenza pandemic because of the mixing and matching of the genetic segments. And here's a hypothetical situation right here. One of the things you have to keep in mind also is it's not merely just like you see here, ducks or chickens. Okay. One of the things that was found in the 2008, 2009 uh, bird flu was that it could be carried by migratory birds. And when we're talking migratory is not going from north to south in North America. We're talking those that jump literally across Europe and then fly down in toward Africa and back. And so some of these um, migratory birds would be carriers of a virus and go thousands of miles before they would if you want to say it, nest or hang out for the um, the weather change, for the seasonal change in another part of the world. Okay. Now, moving on. What you see here is a little bit more um, in depth in the genetics of it all. But you got to keep in mind something that when we're talking about changes, these changes are going to affect not merely uh, some of the proteins that make up virus on the internal part, but also on the external, as you can see by this fine diagram here. Now, the other thing that happens is that another contributor to variations in influenza viruses is pigs. And... Um, it has been seen where in some cases, humans who work, let's say raising swine or in a pig farm, etc., they are going to have influenza strains that are completely unique, okay? And you can see also here, in the red is swine, the yellow is classic swine, the green is avian, the blue is human, and then of course you've got human origin here of this light purple. So what you have is, as time has gone on, different mixings that occur. And these mixings can create strains that, um, because of this reassortment, the human immune system has not been able to deal with, and it may cause a lot more damage to the individual. In other words, it's a much more nastier influenza virus or flu bug 
as you would previously had seen. Okay, so I'm just trying to give you some of these perspectives here so that you can really understand that influenza is not something that can be completely just brushed off. It is a public health concern because the virus will change over time. And it changes in part because of where it's jumping from and what reassortments occur. It could be jumping from pigs. It could be jumping from ducks. It could be jumping from uh, migratory birds to ducks to then human beings. And this is something to keep in mind. Finally, we have a diagram. And now this is depicting something you saw in China in uh, 2013. This is the genetic evolution of this. Now, by the way, remember I talked about the wet markets? Well, wet markets and also people who have their own poultry uh, tend to then have uh, situations where they're going to have a closer association for development of new influenza viruses. Take a look here. You see that the, we have an N7, excuse me, an H7N9. So we had the ducks. They were contributing H7N3. Wild birds were contributing an H7N9. Domestic poultry, chickens, they had multiple viruses that demonstrated H9 and 2. Because they were living together, whether it was in farms, in poultry markets, etc., you had new multiple reassortments occurring. And hence you had H7 and 9 virus, and that was much more um a much greater impact on human health. And this is just the way things are going to happen. Um, it's And it's not just the fact that, you know, if they shut down all the wet markets, what would happen in China? Because if you really look at a lot of the rural areas of China, it is not uncommon for people to be living in close contact with ducks, and other forms of poultry. From there, we're going to move to a couple of different ones which may have potential for being an emerging disease against humans. Um, they are definitely zoonotic, and they've been isolated in certain parts of the world, but they could jump further. So let's talk about them. The first one is Hendra virus. It was found solely in Australia. It's a zoonotic virus. First, it was isolated in 1994, and it's been connected to numerous outbreaks of disease in domestic horses and in seven human cases. Okay. It belongs to the genus called the Henipara virus group. Now, that not only has uh, Hendra uh, virus, but also the Nipah virus, okay? How does this transmission occur? Well, transmission usually occurs to humans um, after exposure to body fluids and tissues or excretions of horses that are infected with the Hendra virus. Um, now, the, vi the horses may be infected after exposure to the virus in the urine of infected flying foxes. These are uh, unique to uh, Australia. They're a type of bat. They're called uh, terapus. And they're a natural reservoir of the Hendra virus. Now, we at present don't have any evidence to date of a human-to-human -human transmission. But let's talk about this for a few minutes. After an incubation of about 9 to six, uh, 16 days, the infection with the Hendra virus can lead to respiratory illness with severe flu-like symptoms and signs. In some cases, the illness may progress to encephalitis, 
Although the infection with the Hendra virus is rare, the case fatality is high. So the mortality is about 57%. Now, this is based on the few cases of humans that did get infected. Four out of seven died. What is the treatment? Well, the drug Revarian has been shown to be effective against the viruses in vitro. Warning. Vitro means in glass. It means in cell culture. It doesn't mean in clinical applications, okay? A post-exposure therapy with a NIPA Hendra neutralizing antibody uh, has been found efficacious in animal models and is, it is presently in preclinical development in Australia. The Australians also have various strategies to teach people, if your horse is acting this way, um, don't go up to it, contact your local vet. The vet may have to literally put on a uh, biohazard suit to examine the animal and to maybe take a couple of blood samples, etc. because of the risk of picking up this virus, okay? Now, here's the situation. And by the way, the Australians, with all respect to them, they have an appreciation for their horses, which is understandable. Unfortunately, you have a lot of these type of unique bats, flying foxes. Um, there are some that are fruit bats. They will lead to the transmission. Now, what happens here? What's going on? The bats don't always have to have, um, you know, like people would think, well, they, they bite people and suck their blood. No, they're not going to do that. They will be um, attracted to fruit. And even if their saliva is on that fruit and the fruit falls uh, or their droppings, that is how horses, which are going to be eating off the ground, are going to pick up the virus. You do have horse to human transmission. And in some other cases, when this happens, then you really have a problem. Um, as you can see, here's the hemiparavirus. Here is the flying foxes. Um, Grooming, mating, lactation, and placental transmission can occur easily with them. They will be consuming fruit, okay? And when they, you know, they have date palms and they consume the sap, this is a situation that can show up. Also, you will have animals such as pigs that will also part uh, consume the partly eaten fruit by the bats. And all of this will lead to basically um, infected material going up to high, higher species. Okay. Now, these are the areas in the world that have reported cases, starting with 1994 and moving outward since then. By the way, just one other thing, and this is nothing against any particular scientific group or anything, but there is a reality here. Sometimes we don't detect diseases until somebody has made the report, et cetera, and we've isolated the virus and we understand what's going on. We can make tests. And once the test gets spread out further, surprise, surprise, it's farther out than we had imagined. Okay. So this may have been possible here earlier than um, 98 and 2001 and 2004, 2005, but they may not have been able to detect it as well. Now that they did, you can see where it's been rising up, moving across um, the archipelago here of Indonesia, going into other areas here. 
Here is the virus, and it's a very long continuous RNA virus. It has a phosphoprotein attachments, and it will have uh, nucleocapsid proteins. It has a fusion protein, and it has an attachment protein. Okay, so we move from there to the Nipah virus. Now, Nipah is a bat-borne zoonotic virus. And these infections occur in humans, other animals, example, pigs. Unfortunately, the disease is a very high mortality rate. And we'll get into that in a minute. Um, there have been numerous disease outbreaks caused by this virus, and they have occurred in Southeast Africa, Southeast Asia, example, Bangladesh, India. Again, fruit bats, also called flying foxes, are the animal reservoir for this particular virus in nature. Uh, the transmission, uh, NIV can be spread to humans from direct contact with infected animals, such as bats or pigs, or their bodily fluids, such as blood, urine, or saliva. Consuming food products that have been contaminated by body fluids of infected animals, palm sap, or fruit contaminated by the infected bat. And then also close contact with a person infected with NIV or their body fluids. That includes nasal or respiratory droplets, urine, or blood. The symptoms typically will appear four to 14 days following exposure to the virus. Now for symptoms, the illness initially presents itself after about, mm, well, this is three to 14 days and when you start having the fever and headache, okay? I know the line above there says four, four to uh, 14 days, but there have been some variations there. But the key point is within about two weeks, fever, headache, signs of respiratory illness, such as a cough, sore throat, and difficulty breathing. Now, this is where it gets really serious because the possibility exists also for brain swelling, encephalitis, that may follow, uh, where the symptoms can include drowsiness, disorientation, mental confusion, and eventually this can rapidly progress to coma within 24 to 48 hours. And death may occur in 40 to 75 percent of the cases. And that is significant. Currently, there are no licensed treatments available for the Nipah virus. Basically, it's supportive care that may include rest, hydration, and treatment of the symptoms as they occur. And again, another RNA virus. You see what you have are these um, proteins, uh, phosphoproteins, etc., that kind of protect that strand inside. You have basically the sequence here of the proteins that are made along that mRNA uh, strand. Uh, you are going to have the fusion protein, which is the yellow, the glycoprotein, which is the red, these are responsible for cellular attachment and host cell entry. Now, the matrix proteins on the inside here, that's the green, and that mediates morphogenesis and budding. This is an enveloped virus again. Remember, that's different from a naked virus. Naked viruses, you can just see the proteins and then inside would be the genetic information. Here, it requires... Uh, a lipid envelope. Now, you're going to have the, the uh, virus ribonucleoproteins, which are playing a role here. You have a polymerase present. And of course, you have a negative sense, single stranded, non segmented viral DNA, uh, viral RNA. Non segment means just continuous strand. Okay. And so I've got here a little bit of a chart here. All you need to know about Nipah. Originally, it was discovered in Malaysia. Uh, it's a 
uh, zoonotic disease. Fruit bats are the primary hosts of it. And uh, here's the other problem. You can have fruit that looks kind of safe, but it can be contaminated by the saliva of the infected bats. Okay. What I mean is they might personally tap into it and then move away or anything else like that. Sometimes also the fruits will fall down to the ground and eventually get picked up by pigs. Okay. So here we have it with the fruit bat blood urine saliva. With the urine, yeah, they can be on the trees and they can do this and that, etc. It can show up in the date palm sap. Uh, it can also end up on contaminated fruit. Um, no matter what you have, the pigs will basically consume all sorts of stuff and they will pass pig to pig. They will also pass on to humans. And then humans, the outbreak is going human to human, and unfortunately, it's 40 to 75% mortality rate. So that's about it for week 14. Now, uh, do review the work, the assigned textbook chapters, the lecture, the lecture PowerPoint, Read all of the supplemental argue, uh, articles in the module week 15. I've included a bunch of articles and videos. You want to participate in the discussion for week 15. Week 15 is a little bit different, so read the instructions exceedingly careful, uh, carefully. Because what you're looking at is almost like a summation of all the diseases you've experienced and all the factors that play a role and all the means to control some of this. So you're going to find this very interesting. You may have to go back and review some of the prior week's videos and supplemental articles. Okay. And as always, cite your, your sources in MLA format. Then you're going to complete with uh, the quiz for week 15. And once that done is done, we're going to start moving into the final last exam. I hope you have a nice week.